At this time, please turn off and put away all your electronic devices, including cell phones. And as a reminder, no recording, personal photography, or note taking of today's governor's forum will be permitted. As chairman of the NAEP Operators Committee, I am beyond excited to welcome NAEP attendees to this special event featuring two of our country's distinguished governors from key energy producing states. In this twist on the world famous Red River rivalry, Governor Abbott and Governor Stitt will discuss the overall energy mix their respective states' plans to help meet domestic and global energy demands and the challenges and opportunities they face in meeting those needs. Please welcome Texas Governor Greg Abbott and Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt, along with our moderator, Jackie Deason, host of The Jackie Daly Show. Good afternoon, NAEP, Houston governors, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you uh, to the NAEP staff and all the people who make this happen, the very special people uh, behind the scenes, David Cape, Mariah, Leanne, uh, Drew, and the gang. So happy to have the governors here. Going to start with Governor Abbott. The oil and gas industry in Texas deposits a significant amount of money into the Texas General Revenue Fund. The money directly supports the business of the state public safety, education, transportation, economic development, how can the state's historic partnership with this crucial industry continue to support Texans and the continued success of our booming economy? Well, thank you for that, Jackie. And uh, I'll answer the question, but before I do, let, let me just say that uh, nothing really gives me more pride than to be with uh, the men and women uh, of the energy industry in the United States of America. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for what you all do. In, in the question that you asked, you, there was a key word in that question, and, and that word is partnership. The best thing that we can do as a state is to partner uh, with those who are in the oil and gas and energy industry. And in fact, that's exactly what Texas does, and it's exactly why Texas succeeds so well, not just in the energy sector, but also across the board economically. Before I elaborate on that, I'm going to prove my point about the importance of this partnership. I have friends here in Texas, for all I know, that may be in the audience, uh, that are involved in the energy industry that for years they had investments in New Mexico that were going well until the leadership in New Mexico changed. And from what they're telling me, the partnership that kind of existed in, in New Mexico has now been eliminated. And it's far more difficult in the energy sector in New Mexico than it was before. In Texas, we maintain that partnership cultivating it, knowing this, and that is if the energy sector can succeed in Texas, Texas will succeed. And that's exactly why we've put policies in place that promote the energy sector, that aid the energy sector in succeeding. And a byproduct of that is that this past year, Texas had the largest budget surplus, not just in Texas history, Texas had the largest budget surplus in America because the energy sector produced so much and provided that revenue to the state of Texas. But here's how that partnership works. When we have a surplus, we know that money does not belong to the state. That belongs to you if you're a Texan. And we return it with the largest property tax cut ever in the history of the state of Texas. That's how this symbiotic relationship works. The other thing that we do is we constantly work on reinvesting that money towards issues that will aid the energy sector. Some quick examples. We constitutionally dedicate our oil and gas severance tax revenue, parts of it, to infrastructure build out. And because of that, Texas is sitting on a record-breaking $144 billion transportation build out fund in the state. A lot of it's been dedicated, for example, to the Permian Basin writ large. Now, we've worked with the Permian Strategic Partnership in, in ways that further this partnership that I'm talking about. Part of it is investing in the oil and gas sector or energy sector. 
but part of it is also investing in the healthcare sectors, in the education sectors, uh, to make sure that whether you're in the Permian Basin or wherever you are, you're going to have access to not just good quality employees, but a, a good quality life environment. And so we, we partner together with our businesses here in the state of Texas to make sure they have the best of all worlds because we want you to succeed. Governor Stitt, in the spring of 2023, you announced that Anil would invest more than $1 billion in a solar cell and panel factory in Oklahoma. How do you balance the energy portfolio of your state between emerging renewable sources and traditional fossil fuels? Well, th thanks for that question. Before we get started, I, I was just backstage reminding Governor Abbott who won the OU Texas game this year. So my memory only goes back to the Big 12 championship game. <laughs> and that's true. I, I went to wait, Oklahoma wait, State, yeah, yeah. and so uh, he got the better of me. But I was down there representing OU when we, uh, when we stole, stole another one from you. So it's a lot of fun with my, with my friend, uh, Governor Abbott. But, yeah, you know, in Oklahoma, Anel is a, is a company that uh, uh, they're, they're going to invest about a billion dollars and build solar, uh, solar panels. And people ask me about that because they know we're an oil and gas state. We're so proud of our oil and gas industry. That is the bedrock industry for our state. And everybody knows to have a reliable, affordable energy grid, you have to have a base load. Uh, but when you're manufacturing, uh, I think Oklahoma is the most business-friendly state in the country, and we, we probably <coughs> argue about that. But uh, I tell people, I don't care if you, you know, manufacture pump jacks or you, you manufacture solar, solar panels. We want you located in Oklahoma for distribution, for workforce. We have some of the most affordable energy in the country. And uh, so, yeah, we welcome kind of a more of everything approach. And I know this industry, uh, they, they just hate it when the federal government is trying to put their, their thumb on the scale and they try to, uh, you know, uh, move things where the economy is not ready to move. So we just believe in a free enterprise. Uh, we believe in innovation. And we just think that we should let the business markets work. And uh, if companies are going to invest a billion dollars, we're, we're, we want to invite them there and, and um, be good, good citizens of Oklahoma. So, um, yeah. Okay, another question for Governor Stitt. Uh, after what appears to be the longest running litigation in wind energy history, 12 years, a federal judge just ordered the deconstruction of 84 wind turbines in Oklahoma because they trespassed upon tribal lands, specifically Osage uh, Mineral Estate. So how is news of this precedent being received in Oklahoma? So th th this is a uh, very, very interesting question. And I think Oklahomans, I think Americans need to open their eyes to what's happening, uh, why elections are so important, why the federal judges are so important. This was an Obama-appointed judge. And also, the tribal movement. I'm actually a member of the Cherokees. Uh, but the giving back to, uh, uh, of tribal lands and, and, and just the, uh, the things that are happening. We had a decision called McGirt that happened in Oklahoma. And basically, the Supreme Court said that we still have reservations existing in Oklahoma. Um, when we had disbanded our reservations at statehood. So it's created all kinds of jurisdictional problems. So we're not surprised that, that uh, a federal judge had, had uh, uh, you know, sided this way. Uh, but they, they want to kind of guise it as a mineral interest issue because they said that whenever they built those turbines, uh, they actually went in and, and, and went a little bit deep or something, and they had the surface rights. Uh, but this is, a, this is definitely a push to to always side with tribal governments. We see it with keystone developments. We see it with permitting. Uh, and I think people need to realize what's happening. Uh, we just had a federal judge put on the bench in eastern Oklahoma who was the attorney general for another one of the big tribes. We think that's problematic. We think we're going to see more and more of these type of issues. And uh, it, it's just a super political thing. It's very disappointing. It's going to cost like $300 million, I think, for them to decommission all those wind turbines. And, and they felt like they did everything right. They followed all the permits. We see it happening. Our friends in North Dakota, uh, them going back and relitigating existing pipelines uh, through uh, reservation lands after they did everything correct. And so I just think people need to be aware of, of what's happening. Uh, as long as I'm governor, I mean, we want to be the most business-friendly state. We're very disappointed in that, in that, uh, 
that ruling. Um, we believe that there needs to be permitting reform, but we need to have some resolution of that. You can't go back and change the game on businesses after they've been in existence for, you know, after they've been rolling. Governor Abbott, how do you balance your state's support for an all of the above energy strategy with policies coming out of the Biden administration? Well, there's, there's two uh, approaches to address the question. First of all, our, our, our goal, uh, Governor, uh, in, in Texas, our goal is always to be number one. And we're probably number one in oil production, uh, natural gas, LNG shipments, uh, in solar and in wind. We don't care what type of energy you make, we just want you to make it. And we want you to help us be number one for energy in our state. That said, part of the balance uh, is involved in exactly what Governor Stitt was talking about, and that is we too have our share of legal challenges uh, with the Biden administration that's trying to uh, use the EPA uh, to compel rules and regulations that would hinder uh, the production of energy. And it really is just outrageous. And so it's, it's a constant process. It's almost like a, a hamster wheel race that you're running because it never stops uh, with regard to fighting back against the regulations that interfere with states like Texas and Oklahoma, where we're just trying to create a platform uh, where uh, generators or providers or creators of energy like you all have the ability to do what you do. We as states need what you do, and we need it un unhindered and as rapidly as you can uh, produce it of whatever source of energy. And so we're on the side of those who are trying to push back against the hamstrings that Washington, D.C. is trying to put on us. Okay, Governor Stitt, as oil and gas companies rush to design and build carbon sequestration projects in the hopes of receiving tax credits under the Inflation Reduction Act, what is Oklahoma doing to protect land and mineral owners as well as future oil and gas production in your state? Yeah, you know, uh, we have to balance, you know, personal property rights with innovation, uh, in, you know, Oklahoma has been an innovator in oil and natural gas for over 100 years. 1949, Halliburton and Duncan, Oklahoma invented fracking. And then I think we've got uh, Harold Hamm in the audience somewhere, and he kind of perfected it in the 2000s. And, and um, so we, we're not afraid of innovation. And now with carbon sequestration to, to the Inflation Reduce Reduction Act to, to receive tax credits, we're trying to get our uh, class... Class six primacy with uh, the EPA. I think we'll be the third or fourth state to get that. Uh, so we like that. We think there's some, some opportunities maybe for enhanced uh, oil recovery. Uh, but we, we, we believe in those innovation, those free markets. At the same time, we're balancing our mineral rights, our, per, our uh, property rights. And, uh, and, and again, again, we're not, we're not afraid of those type of innovations. And uh, we think it, uh, if, the free, if the markets are going to dictate it, then that'd be great. Governor Abbott, every year you've been in office, Texas has been the number one rated state for business, I have to say. Uh, companies come here, they expand here because of the business-friendly climate. No personal or corporate income taxes, uh, young and educated workforce. How can ERCOT, which is Electric Liability Council of Texas, for those of you who are not Texans, uh, and the Public Utility Commission ensure that Texas businesses have the energy they need? So uh, again, in clarifying that is ERCOT is the Texas power grid. Texas, uh, we have our own power grid uh, for, that runs our state separate from all other power grids. And as you might imagine, because of what you're saying, the, the growth that we have in the state of Texas is nothing short of stunning. Last year, there were about 475,000 people moved to Texas. The year before that, about 450,000 people moving to Texas. And that's just part of an ongoing trend and Texas is now home to more Fortune 500 company headquarters than any other state. So whether you're a business, large or small, whether you're, you're an individual, uh, whether you're going to one of our universities, there is a growth spurt. The point of telling you that is that for every person moving here, for every business relocating here, there is an increased demand from our power grid. And so what our state is having to do is constantly add to our power grid. So our power grid, if you, if you look at the, the peaks of what was supplied in this past summer and the peaks of what has already been supplied during the course of this winter, in the summertime we had something like 10 to 12 new all-time record high demands. And those all-time record high demands were about 10 to 15% higher 
than what they were the prior year. The same already for this winter. My point is that we need to be prepared to increase uh, our power supply capability by 10 to 15 percent per year. If I could get detail with you for one moment, in the summertime, uh, we were up uh, over 90,000 megawatts of power demand. Uh, we have the capability of providing over 100,000 megawatts of power. We need to increase that by at least 10 to 15,000 megawatts. So that brings me uh, back to your question a little bit. Because there is such a demand for power and a need, an urgent need for power, a law that I signed a few months ago provides financial incentives for any business that will come to Texas uh, and generate uh, dispatchable power, defined as uh, uh, natural gas, oil, could be uh, nuclear, could be battery, whatever would qualify as dispatchable power. We have abundant, as I pointed out earlier, abundant you know, wind and solar, and wind and solar is being added as we speak. We need more of the natural gas supplied uh, to our base load so that when the sun's not shining, when the wind's not blowing, uh, we will have the power capable of ensuring that all these businesses that are coming to Texas will be able to keep their power on. The good news is you know, because of those incentives, we see great interest across the country and within inside the state of Texas to make sure that power generation increase is going to be there. So for, for those doing business in Texas, for those interested in doing business in Texas, know that uh, that power load is going to be coming uh, to our grid to make sure you are going to have access to the power that you need to make sure you and your company will be able to succeed. Governor Stitt. How would you describe Oklahoma, <clears throat> excuse me, state government leadership in prioritizing our use of domestic energy sources? Yeah, I mean, it's something that our, our, our leaders, the House, the Senate, um, I was just meeting with our energy committees in both the House and the Senate for, for breakfast at the governor's mansion. But we can all agree that oil and gas is our bedrock industry. The energy advantage we have in Oklahoma is so critical uh, to commerce, and it's, uh, it's a huge competitive advantage for us. And, and uh, Oklahoma has 4 million people, so we're the 28th largest state population-wise, 19th largest land area-wise, and we're number six in oil production. We're a little smaller than Texas. Uh, I think we're number five in natural gas production, but we're also number three in wind energy production. Uh, and so we're also a net exporter. We're in the Southwest Power Pool. We only consume about 50% of the energy that we uh, need and so we're a net exporter and so that's a huge competitive advantage for us and we're seeing data centers and AI companies and 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 folks uh, I have met with probably 50 ambassadors every time we go to DC I, I have a strategy an international strategy that meet with these folks all they want to talk about is an affordable reliable energy grid and what's happening in their countries and they are paying a third more than we do here in the US with Oklahoma being, I think we're, we're definitely top 10 and it kind of fluctuates on our energy price to businesses. We're one of the top in the country and that is causing manufacturing. And when you think about data centers, uh, data centers, about 40% of their, their incomes or their uh, expense side will be, will be energy. Uh, and so it's a huge advantage for states like Oklahoma and Texas that are not afraid to lean into the oil and natural gas industry. So we really appreciate you guys. Uh, and then we haven't really talked about this, but um, you know, and you kind of touched on a little bit, but Governor Abbott and I, a couple years ago, you guys remember this in the industry when we had the polar vortex, so the extremely cold weather coming through kind of the, the, the middle part of the U.S. Uh, and Oklahoma, so this is a kind of an interesting story, Governor uh, Abbott and I got on the phone with President Biden. He wanted to have a call with us. You remember this? And he wanted to ask about our grids, how we're holding up, and et cetera, et cetera. And I told President Biden this. I said, listen, I said, uh, and, I, and I tell young people when I'm talking to colleges or high schools that here's, it's so important that you know when you plug your, your, your electric vehicle in or you flip your light switch on, where does that electricity come from? And in Oklahoma, our grid is made up of like 40% wind, 40% natural gas, a little bit of hydro, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of coal. We're not a huge coal state. But during that really cold, uh, really cold weather, our turbines were frozen, right? and we couldn't get any wind generation. So 
basically we had to get coal to make up the difference. And it kind of backfilled. And I tell all of our young people, if we wouldn't have had coal in Oklahoma, you wouldn't have been able to watch TikTok for two solid weeks. And then they're just like, what? Uh, so I tell this story to President Biden and why it's important that we have all of the above. You can't be reliant on one, you know, one form of renewable. And, uh, you know, and he immediately spins and starts asking me about battery technology. Remember? Talking about batteries. Um, so, again, I just think it's so important that we teach that next generation that they understand how important oil and natural gas is for national security. Because uh, we all want cheaper electricity for our citizens. Uh, we all want cheaper prices at the, at the, at the gas pump. And we want to supply our, our allies, right? And then that's why it's such a head-scratcher for us when this administration is, you know, putting a pause on LNG permits and those kind of things. Um, and, you know, the pipeline, Oklahoma is the pipeline capital of the world. So we have in Cushing, Oklahoma, is uh, the largest commercial oil and gas res or oil reserve in the country with 100 million barrels. So, uh, uh, you know, in Canada, they've already got two pipelines that come from Canada into Cushing. Okay, the Keystone XL was going to be the third pipeline. And, uh, and then we kind of bring that oil and gas down to, uh, down to the coast for further processing or, or LNG shipments to our allies. And so it's really our, our friends in Asia and Europe that are going hurt, to be hurt the most and our, our, our producers in, uh, in, in the U.S. That leads to the next question for Governor Abbott. If you could share with, with us your thoughts on the importance of strong domestic energy sector for employment, national security, and global energy demands. Sure. So it's important for, for all those. Uh, for, first of all, you mentioned employment. Listen, uh, we're, we're proud of all the men and women who work in the oil and gas sector and energy sector of, of all different types uh, in the state of Texas. You, you truly do power our state. Uh, and so that's one reason why we reformed our two-year college program in the state of Texas to make sure that it's geared towards uh, training the high-skilled workers who go uh, to work for many of the employers in this room here today. And if you don't know about it, contact your uh, local two-year college because they are wanting to partner with you to make sure that you can tell them, listen, we need people who can make widgets and they got to do X, Y, and Z to make a widget. And they will be fully trained uh, to make a widget. Then you talk about national security and even international security. I mean, we're at a moment in time where we are on a international powder keg when you look at what's going on, look at what's going on in, 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 the, in the Red Sea. Kennedy, I'm, I'm surprised we haven't seen oil spike higher than it has. All it's gonna take is one of those shots by the Hooties to go in a different direction, and that powder keg is, is gonna blow up. My point very simply is this, whether it be that or some other Iranian-based issue, whatever the case may be, we're only a moment away from any type of international event that could really put a kink in the entire system uh, for the energy sector across the world. That is why we focus so much on building out our exploration and production sector in the state of Texas because we don't want to be reliant on some dictator and some foreign land for our energy needs. We need to make sure that we are energy independent in the United States of America. And one way we do that is by fostering an environment where people feel confident that they're going to be able to produce more power, produce more energy, produce more oil and gas, uh, knowing that you will be unhindered in your ability to do so, but knowing that we will have access to it here. And then kind of going back to uh, what Governor Stitt was talking about, about the LNG permits. Listen, we, we are shipping LNG to very important allies across the world. As you all know, in the aftermath of the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, and what happened to the Russian pipeline, uh, the EU has been relied upon LNG that's coming from Texas. Same thing goes for uh, Asian countries uh, across the board. And I just took a trip to India where we met with one of our great democracy allies halfway across the globe that depends upon both oil and gas uh, from the state of Texas. We have to cultivate this international system and then protect it to, to make sure that everyone is gonna be able to access the energy that they need. And let me double back to 
one thing is, is I understand it, what happened in various different locations in the EU when they went too fast and too far on separating themselves from access of fossil fuels for the power. They ran into situations when they were running out of power. We need to make sure that our friends and allies and even our states in the United States understand that you need to take steps with caution to make sure that you and your constituents, your states, and your country are going to be able to keep your power on. It is an existential threat that all of us must be vigilant to, to make sure that we are going to produce the oil and gas and other sources of energy that are going to be necessary to keep the power on. So related question for you, Governor Abbott. If you got a phone call from President Biden or uh, Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm, what advice would you give them uh, for managing the Strategic Petroleum Reserve? Don't sell low and buy high would be one thing. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is, is uh, whatever, whatever happened to the word strategic? It wasn't political petroleum preserve. Uh, listen, it, it, he, he faced challenges with regard to inflation and tapped into the oil reserve. And he's rolled the dice and been lucky that a disaster had not happened during that time period. I don't know where he is uh, with regard to the buying uh, and what the price is he going to be able to buy it at. Uh, but what I know is the commander in chief of our country, our country as a body responsible for protecting the health and safety of all of you, you have to have leaders that are going to keep the oil in the reserve for when it could truly be needed in a national or international emergency. He drained it so low that had we faced one of those emergencies, that strategy would have been unavailable to address that emergency. And we have to approach it far more strategically than he has. You know, just to, just to add, add on to that, one, one other thing, we were, in the, we were at the White House uh, speaking with the president about some, some of these issues. And we brought up, you know, permits and drilling and, and what are you doing? So we, I had my team go back and look the first 19 months of President Biden's administration. Then we went back and looked at the first 19 months of, of Clinton's and Obama's and Bush and, and Reagan, all the way back to Kennedy to find out what permitting had they done because he was trying to make the claim that uh, he, he's, 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 he's authorizing permits. He, he believes that, you know, he's saying all this stuff to us privately. And so we go back and fact check. And here's no surprise to all of us in this room, Ronald Reagan had the most permits, 47 million acres that he authorized drilling in his first 19 months as president. And I mean, I can't remember like 9 million for Clinton, Obama was seven or 8 million, Bushes were right up there. And then Obama, or excuse me, Biden in his first 19 months was 136,000 acres. Okay, that was the difference. And when you look at the bar graph, it's just unbelievable how just they're purposely, whoever's, whoever's running it or in charge, and we're not sure it's him, uh, whatever's happening, their whole mission is to try to, you know, put their thumb on the scale, and you know it, you see it, but it's states like Texas and Oklahoma and states that believe in, in, in a free market system uh, we have your back. We're going to continue to have your back. We're going to continue to push and talk about, you know, uh, just free markets and let's take our foot off the brake and allow American companies to innovate and meet the, meet the needs of Americans. Pretty simple. It's how we all think in this room, and, uh, and we need more of it in Washington, D.C. Governor Stitt, uh, California's zero emissions vehicle mandate requires trucking companies to transition their fleets to 100% electric by 2042. 12 other states have adopted the same standards. Several Democrat-run states have adopted or are developing ordinances prohibiting natural gas hookups or mandating electrification of heating and cooling systems. What is your opinion of these initiatives? <laughs> well, they're stupid, all right? They're absolutely stupid. I mean, it, it, makes, it makes zero sense. 
I, I just find it, we just find it funny. I mean, uh, Hertz, Hertz is now backing off. Did y'all see that? 20,000 electric vehicles, they're changing directions. I hope they fire their executive that thought that was a great idea, number one. And because the market's not ready for it. Every, every person that was going to buy an electric vehicle apparently already has. And you're seeing even, you know, the demand in, in, in the batteries and all the different manufacturing that was going to be popping up around the country. They're starting to take a, take a back. They see, they see the demand is not there. I think Ford is starting to kind of get uh, a little nervous about their investments. Um, and so it's just, it's just non-practical. Um, we, we, we believe, and again, we always talk about it, you know, wh why are you trying, why don't you just let the market uh, meet the needs? And if you want to drive a, a King Ranch F-250, do that. If you want to drive a Tesla, do that. Uh, but why is the government trying to mandate this stuff? That's just so un-American. It's, uh, it's not right. It's not what we believe in. It's not the way capitalism works. And anytime the government gets involved and tries to fix one thing, they break 25 other things, right? I see that as governor. Coming from the private sector, we, we need to just take our foot off the brake. Government needs to get out of the way. Let, let companies innovate. Let, they, let them meet the needs of Americans. If I could add to that, in Texas, we have some cities that like to try to emulate San Francisco or Los Angeles or something like that. Anyway, there were several of them that either had passed or were about to pass a ban on natural gas hookups. And we said, not in Texas. And so we passed a law banning any local ban on natural gas hookups. I, I got to get that done in Oklahoma, Governor. That's, that's, uh, that's really good. But I don't, I don't have too many cities trying to do that right now. Well, Governor Stitt, what issues or challenges have you seen in your state related to uh, the rapid or some might say forced transition to alternative forms of energy? So, say, ask that question again. What, what challenges have you had as far as the rapid transition uh, to alternative energy? Yeah, well, I mean, before I became governor, there, they were, there was a push to kind of really incentivize wind energy and, and those kind of things. So we had to pull back. So we're put kind of the uh, same type of deal I've been kind of ranting against is the government get involved with over incentivizing certain things. Well, if you if we have gross production tax on uh, oil and natural gas, and so then you're incentivizing something, so you're paying people to do this, which then takes away the ability from an asset that you have that you actually the state makes money on, and it just makes no financial sense. So we had to change that. We 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 made sure that we kept our promises, but we stopped you know those incentives from the state level. I know there's still tons of those federal incentives. Uh, but again, we're not against wind. Again, we're number three in wind energy. We, we, we have a lot of companies that like to buy the mix of, uh, of, of, of our energy. It drives down some of the cost. Uh, but we just don't like the fact when you have to incentivize things. We believe more in a free market, and I just think that's the right way to approach things. Let the, let, let the demand, uh, um, let, let the companies come follow the demand. Governor Abbott, you mentioned India, one of the most populous countries on earth. Much of our business with India is energy related. Can you tell us about the trip and future business opportunities you see between Texan and Indian companies? Sure, so a, a very effective trip to India. And so, uh, so everyone can understand the context and that is uh, the US is the world's oldest democracy and India is the world's largest democracy. And we're literally halfway across the globe from each other. And it's important for democracies across the world, like the US, Israel, and India, to make sure that we collaborate together so that we can, for one, protect each democracy, but also to perpetuate democracies across the globe as opposed to having them eliminated. And one of the most effective tools that we have to make sure that we can strengthen each other is to expand our economic ties together. We have been doing that for years now, in part, as you pointed out, uh, Texas is uh, number one in the United States for exports uh, to India and from India. Texas is number one for foreign direct investment by Indian companies, number one for jobs created by Indian companies that invest in the United States. And we work this trade back and forth. Also, if you look at the amount of oil that we ship to, from Texas to India, it's been on a skyrocket. Uh, during the time of Modi as the prime minister. 
the, the shipments of LNG, they, they were strong early. Uh, there has been a redu slight reduction of it, uh, but they are prepared to have a, a far much greater increase in LNG shipments from Texas. And then on the in investment side, there are uh, some energy-based companies in India, as well as other businesses in India uh, that uh, are looking to dramatically expand uh, to the tune of multi-billion dollar investments uh, in the state of Texas. And so I would say that uh, business-wise and economically, uh, there is a very strong partnership already uh, that is just getting stronger by the day, and that the strength of that partnership, I think, aids the entire globe uh, as together we work to make sure that we're going to be able to work with a common friend. If I could, one, one last thing about this, and that is, I think all of us learned something during the time of COVID, and, and that is we had farmed out to a country that in reality was, if not hostile, definitely a, an enemy to us, and every need that we had from the medicines that we needed, from the garments that we needed, to everyday supplies were made by a country that we were relying upon where COVID came from. And we learned our lesson. And that is, we should not be dependent upon other countries, especially those that may be hostile to us. And as a result, one thing that we are doing as a country, and definitely one thing we are doing as in Texas, is we're looking to build relationships with, we call them nearshoring, onshoring, reshoring, or uh, friend shoring, and work with our friends. And in doing so, we know we're going to have a good working relationship for the long term, but also in doing so, especially when we work with friends like India halfway across the globe, we can have almost like a, a belt across the world of strength from one side to the other, knowing that the sun will never set on democracy in the world as long as we partner together and strengthen each other. And already you are seeing that there are many businesses, Apple is an example, uh, that's removing some of their businesses and operations from China and moving it to India. And you will see a lot more of that take place over the coming years uh, as India continues to grow from what it is right now, the fifth largest economy in the world, uh, to becoming the third and maybe eventually the second largest economy. And while I do that, one last point I'll make is we consider ourselves to be in league uh, with India uh, because Texas has the eighth largest economy in the world. Uh, as we gather here today, the only countries with an economy larger than Texas are the US, China, India, Japan, the UK, Germany, and France. By this time next year, Texas will exceed the GDP of France. We will have the seventh largest economy in the entire world. Many of you are part of that gross domestic product we have right here in Texas. And Oklahoma is just right above Texas. <laughs> Governor Stitt, uh, maybe the flip side of this question. Oklahoma enacted legislation last year to close a loophole to prevent people not living in the U.S. from buying property in Oklahoma. What are your concerns with foreign ownership of property in oil, gas, wind, or agricultural areas in your state? Yeah, th thank you for that question. Um, we, we, we did, we just saw a lot of, especially around the, our marijuana industry. We, we passed, right before I became governor, uh, medical marijuana. I don't know, do you all have that? In, in, <laughs> good. <laughs> don't, don't do it. It's terrible. So there was a state question, and, uh, and, and we, we passed, you know, they thought it was going to be medicine. Now, anybody with a hangnail can get a medical card, okay? So th this whole industry popped up overnight, and we saw, you know, Russia, China, uh, Mexico drug cartels kind of moving in, buying up land and, and, uh, and, and farmland. And then we saw that around military bases and we started asking questions. But uh, CFIUS is a, is a federal agency that really should be uh, determining who has the right to own land. And we need the federal government kind of getting more involved with that. So we banned that. Then we found out there were a lot of straw buyer situations where they would you know, go to their buddy and have the buddy buy the land for them and, or some attorney or something. And so just trying to crack down on that, get our arms around it. Uh, I'm proud to say that because of our efforts to enforce it, 
Uh, we literally are down 76% in number of growers and dispensaries. Uh, we've gone from being known as the wild west of weed to, uh, to now we, we, we literally uh, have really, really good enforcement actions on that. So, uh, but I think the feds need to get involved. You're seeing other states. You're seeing uh, uh, you know, the CPP buying up land, farmland, and, and you really have to – we need to be smart about that. Right. I mean, nobody has been a bigger champion of, of closing the southern border than than my friend Governor Abbott right here. And he needs a lot of kudos for that. And ho hopefully we get a chance to talk to him about that. But, but I've got to get this in real quick, because I, I, in every audience, I'm trying to make sure people understand uh, our, our, our debt and what's happening. And, and I just had my state of the state address on Monday and I shared, you know, there's never a. There's never a shortage of good ideas or lobbyists or come fund this program or this government idea or this inflation reducing act or, or whatever thing that everybody comes up with. Uh, but you have to have some kind of governor on spending, right? So just for example, last year, the federal government brought in revenue wise of $4.4 .4 trillion. So that was our revenue, okay? Well, how much do you think we spent last year? It wasn't 4.4, .4, it was 6.1. So they spent $1.7 trillion over our revenue, all right? So that doesn't include what we are in our national debt right now. So we have $34 trillion in national debt. So that's our, our debt, all right? So I'm, I come from the mortgage business, the banking business, and, and we all bought our first house, and we got a 30-year fixed mortgage, right? Some of the lucky people might have got a 15-year fix, but the 30-year fixed mortgage is very standard. And it's very depressing when a young when you get your first statement and you mail your payment in and the whole thing is interest. There's only like fifty dollars as principal, right? But you know, at least in thirty years, you're going to have your house paid off. Okay. Well, let me. What we're doing with our national debt? It's interest only. That means we're never paying it off. All we're doing is just servicing the interest on it. All right. So that's not good. Furthermore, furthermore, the interest now with the rates ticking up is over a trillion dollars. So your interest only payment just on the debt is a trillion dollars. Well, that's bad enough, but we're still piling on like 1.7 trillion. This year, I think the deficit spending might be over 2 trillion. Well, if there's no governor, spend 8 trillion, 9 trillion, 10. My point is, this is we have got to get this figured out. We need both parties are at blame that nobody has any restraint to say no in Washington, D.C. Leaders have to lead and say, hey, we have to have a governor on this thing. It's got to be, it's got to be what our revenue is. We cannot keep on this deficit spending. We're going to be, we're going to be screwing our, sorry for saying that. Uh, we're going to be, this is going to be very, very bad for the next generation. <laughs> all right. All right, well. Don't tell my mom I said that. No, sir. Well, we are all out of questions and right on time. So again, big round of applause for two of the best governors in America, Abbott and Stitt. Thank you all so much for joining us for this powerful and moving event. I'm Julie Woodard, the Assistant Chairman for the NAEP Operators Committee. It is such an honor to be a part of the energy industry and a supporter of our American soldiers. Again, I want to thank Governor Abbott, Governor Stitt, and Jackie Deason, along with our NAEP partners, the American Association of Professional Landmen, the Independent Petroleum Association of America, the American Association of Petroleum Geologists, and the Society of Exploration Geophysicists for supporting energy and making this event possible. Don't forget to take advantage of the networking opportunities at the Charities Celebration and the Icebreaker starting at 5 o'clock. Both events are hosted on this floor of the Convention Center. Thank you all again for joining us and have a great summit.